Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Daniela Caruso. Uh, I'm, I welcome you to the Center for the Study of Europe uh, at the Pardee School of Global Studies. Um, I am delighted today to have an esteemed guest, uh, Professor Quinz Lobodian. He, uh, he is a historian of modern international history with a focus on North-South politics, social movements, and the intellectual history of neoliberalism. He is currently an associate professor at Wellesley College. He has authored two books. The most recent is titled Globalists, The End of Empire and the Birth of Neoliberalism. It was published by Harvard University Press in 2018. The other book is titled Foreign Front, Third World Politics in 60s West Germany. And this was published by Duke University Press in uh, 2012. He is also the editor of Comrades of Color, Is Germany in the Cold War World? and the co-editor of Nine Lives of Neoliberalism. He is currently working on the capitalism of the far right. Our discussant today is Andrei Mamolia. Um, he is a historian of international law and politics, specializing in late 19th and early 20th century. He joined the Pardee School faculty as assistant professor of international relations in September 2020. Professor Mamolia's core research challenges the widespread notion that the United States was the driving force behind the development of international law and shifts attention to the neglected but important role of Latin America and East Central Europe. He is currently working on two book projects that draw on extensive research in archives across the Americas and Europe. The first is a new history of the loss of war that examines how the United States resisted international standards. And the second book is a history of international law in the Americas. So I would like to uh, ask Professor Slobonia to begin his uh, presentation. Uh, the presentation is based on the paper uh, Demos Veto and Demos Exit, the neoliberals who embraced referenda and secession. This is when history um, gets very, very close to the present time. Uh, thank you so much. Looking forward to this. Great. Thanks a lot to Daniela and Elizabeth for arranging this and to Andre for, uh, for uh, agreeing to comment. And also welcome to Boston, Andre. I don't know if you physically relocated here yet, but I'm right across the river from BU right now. I live in Cambridge, so I feel like this is a local affair, even though it's all being mediated through the screen as usual these days. All right, so I've got um, some slides which I'll share just as a kind of a setup for the body of what I want to discuss today. And the paper came out of a sort of desire to dig deeper into something that one hears very often. And what one hears very often is a kind of a basic and sometimes rather blunt claim that neoliberalism is anti-democratic. First thing I wanted to do was to figure out what people meant when they made this claim. What exactly is the content of this claim as well? So this is the first argument that if you read neoliberals, they seem to be um, bearish on democracy at best. Therefore, neoliberalism has an anti-democratic streak. However, that's not the only way that people seem to be making this claim. Another way that people seem to be making this claim is not in terms of just the texts or the theory, but that neoliberal institutions, by which they usually mean sort of non-majoritarian or guardian institutions, remove policy areas from contestation by democratically elected legislatures into either a technocratic space of expert assessment and rules or an executive space of exception and emergency. And often, you know, the argument is made of thinking about the work of people like Jacqueline Best, or Will Davis, who have argued that emergency and rules often work together, right? The sort of a Schmidtian argument about the fact that what makes these institutions powerful is the ability to suspend their own rules when they steam it to be necessary. What kind of non-majoritarian or guardian institutions do we have in mind here? I mean, things like the European Commission, International Investment Arbitration Courts, the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, central banks, uh, port authorities, um, the, the, uh, the form of corporate governance through boards, and so on. Another thesis that people use that's actually different from the first two, that's not about the text and it's not about the institution, is a more ambiguous one 
more, uh, let's say, at home in the world of sociology than in the world of history or politics, which is just the idea that there are neoliberal norms that have unsettled and eroded the conditions for the existence of a kind of a broader democratic culture in the kind of Sheldon Wolin sense, not just you know, putting an exit next to a candidate uh, for once every four years, but a space of civic engagement, a space of pluralism and discussion and so on within a society. The argument is that these neoliberal norms include pressures of interpersonal competition, overwork, underemployment, precarity, personal indebtedness, that make it more difficult to have time, in short, to engage in something like a full civil society or democratic culture, and it comes along with sort of personally disempowering discourses of market shame, inadequate creditworthiness, and a sense that it's one's own fault if one is not, you know, passing muster within the competitive marketplace. So here I'm thinking of the work of people like, again, Wendy Brown, actually, Michelle Fair, um, Henry Giroux. Um, this is more the way that neoliberalism is talked about also in kind of the space of of Afro-pessimism and critical race studies and thinking of the work of Adolf Reed and people like that who say that neoliberalism is a kind of a mentality that makes democracy impossible. Now, some people see these, see these theses kind of working together, right? So some people say that the, um, the ideas have informed the institutions. So we can see neoliberal theory in part as a kind of a blueprint for some of these guardian institutions or non-majoritarian institutions. Here, people like Thomas Biebrischer write about Buchanan's influence on balanced budget amendments, for example, or things like the Schuldenbremse or the debt break in Germany. Um, Werner Bonfeld has talked about the influence of order liberalism on aspects of European monetary union or um, the hiving off of control from parliaments and the concentration of executive power in the European Commission and the European Council. Others combine the latter two theses to say that it's the operation of those institutions that then trickles down into states of mind or mentality and producing a kind of um, a vacuum of democratic engagement, not something that existed a priori or just simply through you know, the workplace, but that the governing institutions by downgrading the importance of citizen engagement end up producing the very lack of citizen engagement that they assume or that they desire. Here, uh, I think about the work of people like Colin Crouch and David Graywall and Jedediah Purdy. So thesis one and two sometimes combine that the theory and form the design of institutions. Theses two and three sometimes combine that the institutions produce the norms of an anti-democratic culture. One of the ways this was best posed was by the um, you know, now late, now late uh, political scientist, Peter Mayer, in his wonderful book, Ruling the Void, in which he asked, if the era since the Cold War's end supposedly marked the unchallenged victory of democracy, the political system, the sort of crude version of the end of history thesis, then why have the primary institutional innovations since then been in the opposite direction towards insulating decision-making? from majoritarian influence. Many people have given just this one word answer, right? Neoliberalism. Why has that happened? Well, neoliberalism. Well, as I think it's already made, made clear, simply saying neoliberalism is probably not enough. So we need to begin by clarifying uh, what we mean when we say that. But this also in my argument, in as I'll present it today, kind of leaves out both important differences within neoliberalism and specifically some radicalized versions of democracy rather than anti-democracy that are now part of the neoliberal tradition. So what do I mean by that? First of all, there's a real range of thinking within neoliberal thought. So just to say neoliberal theory is actually itself only a starting point rather than an end point. A couple of distinctions there we could think of is for example, that between minarchy, meaning a minimal state, versus no state, pure private ordering, which is the model of so-called anarcho-capitalism. Both of these um, arguments exist within 
the world of sort of mold tolerant society thought, someone like Murray Rothbard representing the anarchist capitalist strain now represented actually um, also within the space of the Alternative for Germany party on the German far right contains bizarrely enough anarcho-capitalists. On the other hand, minarchist people who believe that the state needs to limit itself to you know, protection of contract, um, defense of external borders and um, the uh, defense of private property. But these alone already create different spaces for democracy. Can democracy be uh, practiced, but under certain constraints, or must it be eliminated altogether? That's already in, an argument that libertarians and neoliberals have been having for a century now. And yet, a lot of the time in the generalizations about neoliberalism and democracy, one doesn't see those kind of rather large differences within what neoliberal um, thought might actually mean. Secondly, of course, there are non-neoliberal traditions of anti-majoritarian thought, um, not only those in the, the sort of authoritarian forms of liberalism that tend more towards fascism than a kind of uh, market authoritarianism, but of course also um, the dictatorship of the proletariat and things like socialism are also not majoritarian. The idea of a party vanguard is itself also anti-democratic, but one hears less frequently that socialism is anti-democratic in its present version than one hears the statement that neoliberalism is anti-democratic. Most interesting though, and, and what, I, what I will focus on for the rest of my time today is the overlooked and I think unjustly neglected embrace of some forms of direct democracy, specifically the referendum, by some neoliberals in the last few decades. Why is this important? Because I think right now, when people say neoliberalism and democracy, the main thing they think of is the demos being bound by these institutional safeguards, um, locked in free trade arrangements, um, the contractual clauses that require arbitration by third party courts, this, this range of kind of ways in which the protection of assets is encoded in Katerina Pistor's argument. But as I'll argue in a minute, there's another way that we can think about this, which is the embrace of practices of referendum as a demos veto on state power. And also in the extreme case, the idea that those practices of direct democracy can have an outcome that involves secession, that involves what we call a demos exit. And I would I'll say right off the bat that I'm not sort of wedded to this way of describing them in these specific terms because I, I have had pushback from people in the more in the legal field who have argued that it's sort of um, a contradiction in terms, for example, to say that part of a population can form itself as a demos and, and, and perform this sort of act of departure, that that um, is at odds with the way that the demos concept operates within democratic theory, which assumes a kind of a unitary body, not something that is subdividable, but maybe something we can pick up on in discussion afterwards. So from there, I want to give a little bit of um, more empirical detail about what I'm discussing. If that, those are the kind of intellectual stakes. That's the kind of place I want to insert myself in an already existing scholarly discussion about the relationship between neoliberalism and democracy. What are the specific case studies that sort of help us think about um, this more clearly? Well, the, the two main examples that I want to focus in on are both broadly coming out of what you would call the public choice tradition. The public choice tradition is associated most directly with the, the, the Virginia School Nobel Prize winning economist James Buchanan. And in the last few decades, there's been kind of an extraordinary fusion of the American based public choice tradition with what was once the sort of distinct and separate German ordo liberal tradition. So I would say since the 1980s, the so called Freiburg School, um, which uh, is most associated in its origins with people like Walter Eucken and uh, Franz Böhm, some of who I write about in my book, Globalists, 
is now um, in such intense transatlantic continual dialogue with the work of people in the field of constitutional economics and public choice theory that they've kind of come to constitute the same um, epistemological field, I would say. Um, and it's there actually that we see a sort of a conversation that happens between Germany and the United States beginning really in the 1990s that culminates in a kind of embrace of the technique of the referendum as something to arrive at neoliberal goals. So instead of constraining democracy, you see um, new ways that you can kind of weaponize and direct it towards your desired end. So what's the context for all of this? It's a very specific historical context and it's the 1990s. It's the wake of the Cold War. The neoliberal thinkers that I look at who are associated with the Mont Pelerin Society, you would think would be overjoyed by the end of the Cold War. You would think they would say Soviet communism is dead. East Germany is no more. It's been absorbed into West Germany. The capitalist segment of Germany. Um, our job is done, right? Hayek is getting, gets the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1992. They start putting busts of Mises and Hayek into libraries and public squares all over Eastern Europe. You would think it would be just party time, right? Well, but it, it wasn't, in fact. Um, they had a uh, fear that, in fact, the battle only seemed to have been won. And it was a kind of a Pyrrhic victory. As James Buchanan himself put it, socialism is dead, but Leviathan lives on. So statism, they believed, had not been defeated, even if the specific example of Soviet-style communism had been. What were the new enemies as far as they were concerned? Well, the new enemies they thought were environmentalism. Um, almost immediately, there was discussion that communism had gone from red to green, that environmental regulations now would be a way of strangling the autonomy of the, the free market actor. And the entrepreneur would now be burdened with excessive regulations under new attention to things like um, climate change, which as you know, we can sometimes forget was an enormous discussion right at the end of the 1980s and early 90s in a way perhaps not um, equaled until very recently. So there was green communism. There was um, civil rights movement and feminism, which was seeking to produce new bonds again on the freedom of private actors to hire and fire as they will, to create you know, homogeneous communities if they want to, to appoint who they want to, um, to uh, positions within their own companies, um, seeking what they saw as a kind of forced equality. So environmentalism, civil rights and feminism, two bugbears. But interestingly enough, the other big one was the European Union. Um, beginning right at the end of the Cold War, there was a fear that on the part of the neoliberals, and this is something I've you know, reconstructed and follow, followed through their, the records of their, their meetings in this time, was that the EU had lost its way. That with the 1986 Single European Act, um, there had been a, a move in the correct direction, which was a focus on the four freedoms, the creation of a common market, uh, a single European market. The economic imperative was foremost. But with the move now to uh, European Monetary Union, you know, which was decided already at the beginning of the 90s, a mistake had been made. There was a centralization of authority um, that would create the possibility that you'd have a new dictatorial rule basically from the ECB in Frankfurt when it would be established. And paired with that, Jacques Delors as president of the commission looked to them like, what he was, technically speaking, which was a socialist who would produce this um, transfer union, re reinvent Europe as a space of redistribution and um, egalitarianism under the sign of his code word of social Europe. So it's amazing, of course, in some ways, for those of you who know these debates well, as I'm sure many of you do, considering this is a center for the study of Europe. Um, it's quite jarring to find people at the same time on the left describing, you know, this social Europe as a sham for just a more accelerated hyper-capitalist Europe. And then on the right, in the neoliberal right, people saying the exact opposite, that no social Europe is real. 
that's going to turn this um, European community into a Euro communist, um, you know, behemoth, and it must be fought at all costs. So, you know, right from the beginning there, you see how European integration in the 90s was facing sort of enemies on both uh, poles of the political spectrum. So how to confront this fear of a kind of um, Brusselsization, as they would sometimes also called it, the fear of a new um, super state from Brussels, as Margaret Thatcher famously put it in her Bruges speech. Well, one of the ways that they decided to confront this was to rediscover what they thought of as the kind of the lost virtues of populism. And they began to use the term quite openly. A case in point is Antonio Martino, who was the president of the Montpellier Society after the Berlin Wall fell. And in the first meeting that they had after the Berlin Wall fell, he, among other things, he said, socialism is dead, but statism is not. Environmentalism in the European community and the ever expanding uh, percentage of state spending to GDP all showed that the that you know the road to serfdom was still in the future, so we needed to watch out. And so, what did he do? He became a founding member of Berlusconi's Forza Italia party, and he served in two of his cabinets, and and advocated the space of the nation and the appeal to the common person, understood as a kind of petty bourgeois market actor rather than a kind of member of a welfare state as the person who could become the, um, the foot soldier against a socialist style European integration. Um, there was, there's examples that one could follow also from the Swiss case. Uh, some of the Montpellier Society people in the early 90s were enthusiastically back in Christoph Blocher, who is a you know, extraordinarily wealthy businessman who entered politics, um, specifically trying to combine um, ideas of free market values with a defense of ethno-nationalism, anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant sentiment um, through his uh, Swiss People's Party in the early 1990s. <clears throat> One of, the, one of the tools, of course, that the neoliberals realized at the beginning of the 90s was quite effective in attempting to roll back any movement towards Europeanization or regulatory Brusselsization, as they called it, was the referendum. The, the prehistory of this is not in Europe, but in the taxpayer revolts in California in the late 1970s, when famously um, a proposition was passed which prevented the raising of more revenue through taxes without a supermajority, which made it very difficult to um, match the kind of entitlements that socially generous California had promised to people. Friedman was involved with that, designing this proposition. Buchanan was involved with it. He was very excited about it. And it gave a first inkling that the people perhaps could be used uh, to create new, through referendum to create new veto points against a potentially expansionary revenue creating state. In the 1990s, this was an example that uh, people talking about how to uh, confront the specter of expansionary Europe returned to as an example of um, mobilizing direct democracy against uh, what they saw as state as socialism. California was one example. The other example was Switzerland. So Switzerland, as I'm sure many of you know, has a very robust uh, apparatus of direct democracy at their fingertips. You can propose changes to the constitution through popular initiatives. All constitutional changes must be approved by referendum. And the expansion of state spending is often subject to approval through referendum too. Um, in the 1990s, neoliberals had uh, Swiss, often public choice economists, giving, giving talks in their meetings, explaining how, um, in, in some cases, importantly, the referenda had moved against the arguments that were being made by almost the entire elite political class. So there were some indeed kind of like attention grabbing examples of this in the late 80s and the early 90s. For example, in Switzerland, um, 
the referendum the a referendum attempt to join the 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 european um or to join the un was struck down by popular referendum and the attempt to uh join the european uh what was it now the european free trade area was struck down by direct democracy in the early 1990s and these were as, as um neoliberals who came and gave talks pointed out these were both uh initiatives that were heavily supported by the entire political class from the media corporate leadership people from all the political parties with the exception of um christoph Blocher's at uh, social people's party um and yet they went down through popular referendum so in the in the 1990s, the public choice economists in Germany, Switzerland, and, and to a lesser extent, France, were talking about how they could sort of rethink the European constitution in such a way, or the, you know, not in the literal sense because there was no European constitution, but how they could rethink the laws of European integration in such a way, the treaties integration, so that they could allow for a potential veto point through popular action, through direct democracy. One important example of that is the European Constitutional Group, which formed in Berlin and operated through the 90s up until the present, who in the 90s were, work, were pushing hard for a, an article to be added to the, the Maastricht Treaty to allow for um, secession from the European Union. Um, this is before the existence of the one that was used eventually, of course, by the UK Article, Article 50. Article 50. Um, so in the 90s, they were they were trying to, they were, they were proposing these sort of draft constitutions of for the European Union that would include a right of secession that could be triggered by popular ballot referendum modeled on the Swiss case. In the early 2000s, of course, for people like them, there was good news in the sense that um, in the sense that the attempts to actually uh, deepen European integration through referendum <laughs> ran into some troubles in the early 2000s. And this gave them further hope that in fact, the sort of the sentiment of the people was actually against the move towards greater um, integration, including uh, towards greater, uh, well, in, towards greater labor market integration and towards things like the movement towards uh, equalization because of certain binding rules. Of course, that's sort of how we think about neoliberals most of the time, I think, is like so people that love rules and they want to do things like, um, you know, locking in a certain amount of, of deficit that you're not allowed to go over, right? This is often seen as like a classic neoliberal thing is the kind of the uh, deficit rules inside of the European Monetary Union. But in fact, we, if we look at the case of referenda and even secession, we see a very different attitude towards democracy, which is democracy is something that is a kind of a resource that can be used for different ends. It can be used potentially to break up polities into competing jurisdictions, which someone like Lars Feld recently departed as the head of the German Council of Economic Advisors, he called that the fragmentation hypothesis, saying that, hmm, maybe actually democracy is good because we can use democracy to multiply jurisdictions, thus producing, you know, tax competition, thus producing um, competition for scarce resources, mobile, mobile talent, mobile capital. So democracy could serve an important role to, as a sort of um, a tool for getting to uh, multiple new jurisdictions. You can also use it as a kind of a veto on state expansion in the taxpayer revolt model, or in the extreme version, as described by um, another former president of the Malpelerin Society, um, Jesus Huerta de Soto, you could use, as he called it, um, the democracy for the deconstruction of the state itself. The argument being that if you believe in the willingness of voters to push back against state spending under most circumstances, which he did, then you could use it to say, keep, you know, you put 
one thing after the other on the public ballot to the public ballot. And ideally you end up shredding eventually state revenue down to nothing. I mean, this is of course, probably a misguided way of thinking about how people would actually operate under such circumstances, but it is an interesting innovation in neoliberal thinking, which is the way that direct democracy can serve as a kind of a pickaxe against the monolith of the state, chipping away at parts of it, chipping away at sectors of state spending over time until you, have, you are left with something like a minarchic or a even stateless form of capitalism. That would be, of course, at the utopian end of things. At the less utopian end of things is, of course, and I'll, I'll end here, is the more familiar cases, the case of Brexit, for example, which comes straight out of these conversations as well. The Bruges group was formed within the Mont Pelerin Society. And as their website happily proclaims today, they provided the intellectual framework for the decision of the UK to leave the European Union. Um, UKIP was formed from within the Bruges group by the head of the Bruges group at the time, Alan Sked, LSE professor. Um, the embrace of the call for a referendum on membership in the European Union is um, coming out of this Buchananite discussion of the usefulness of something like a taxpayer revolt being directed at European integration. The Alternative for Germany Party, which was formed, as I, as I outline in the paper, by public choice economists from Germany in the early 2000s, of course, as a protest against the centralization of monetary power under the European Central Bank, similarly has pushed and embraced Swiss-style referenda on things like immigration, refugees, um, and, of course, the departure from the euro and the return of the Deutschmark. So those are a couple of real life examples. I would like to collaborate with people who know more about other countries, especially Eastern Europe, to know about the, the uses to which the kind of imagination of the direct democracy has been turned in those cases too. But I do think this, this is um, a help for, helpful way for us to get out of the kind of a cul-de-sac by which we say simply neoliberalism is anti-democratic and think we've made an argument. Instead, I think we need to unpack that, see how it operates, and then introduce this new dynamic and still transforming um, iteration of democracy as a weapon for shrinking of the state or maybe the dissolution of the state. Okay, I think I'll leave with that and just look forward to a conversation. Thank you uh, so much, Quinn. That was uh, great. Um, in terms of collaborating with people, especially in Eastern Europe, who are doing this kind of work and figuring out how the power of the people can be deployed um, in uh, non-traditional ways. Uh, on, uh, I want to put a plug for an event of May 24th. We are having Boyan Bugaric and uh, Mark Tashnet, uh, uh, comparative constitutionalists, who are going to work on what constitutionalist strategies mean in populist times. Uh, things like packing the court, uh, what do you do with that kind of technique, depending mm -hmm. on the strategic needs you have. So uh, May 24th at 12.30, uh, right. Tashnet and Paric presenting their book on constitutionalism. Uh, sorry for this short detour. I will uh, let Andre start with questions and then we'll join him later. Uh, please, Andre. Okay. Uh, thank you, Quinn, for that great presentation and this wonderful paper. I learned a lot. Uh, a, a lot of what you said is just intuitive, convincing, uh, and to some extent not surprising. Um, it makes sense that there would be this attempt to bind the state from below to complement existing efforts to bind it from above. Um, so especially since the, much of the paper is focused on, on these attempts, uh, initial attempts in California, the experiments in, in, in Switzerland, this is this is pretty intuitive to me, and it makes sense that there will be these efforts to to to, to bind from below, in addition to, to, to from 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 on top. Mm -hmm. the, the interesting potential is is where there is a clash, right? Where where the, these attempts at referendum don't stop at the national level, but they move on to attack the supranational level, including those institutions created by by other branches of the neoliberal movement to constrain the state, and and that's that sort of. Um, it, it's there at the margins in the introduction and the conclusion of the paper, but I'm going to really focus in on because I think it's the most the, the most interesting aspect, and I, I, I but I assume that your book is going to be building up to. Uh, so I, I want to know more about this 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 social Europe, which seems to have been uh, what prompted 
a reaction against the supranational institutions uh, mm -hmm. that were initially designed to, to, to bind states. I want to know whether uh, it actually had legs, the idea, whether this was sort of an imagined threat manufactured to uh, extend the life, you know, give a purpose to the, the neoliberal movement in a post-communist era, uh, or, 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 or was it, was it, was it sort of uh, something that people uh, genuinely believed was a threat um, in which case, how do we ex explain sort of a movement that's being driven by irrational fears for something that, that would have never actually occurred? So that's, that's the first question. I'd like to know more about, about, uh, about Jacques Delors, about uh, this, this social Europe and, and, um, and, and the reaction against it. Um, the next set of question is, I wanna know more about how the neoliberals put these ideas uh, into practice. So a, a lot of the, your research um, is, is very close analysis of, of the conferences, the meetings of, of, of these, uh, the people who are actually part of the neoliberal movement, uh, the different associations. Uh, so it's, it's always interesting to see how people who are somewhat removed from politics then manage to translate uh, their projects into reality. Uh, so it's, it'd be interesting to know more about the ECG group, this, this proposal for Article 50, when did they start thinking about the, the need for secession? Um, and, 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 and how do their initial attempts to sort of create a legal basis for it then, uh, then connect to the referenda of the 2000s, the no vote, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. in, in France and, and, and the Netherlands? Uh, and, and because my sense and when, I, when I lived through these moments is that there was a, there doesn't seem to have been a, and at a, at a superficial level, there doesn't seem to have been a connection to the neoliberal movement. These were sort of votes that were justified initially uh, as, as having been prompted by a, a democratic deficit uh, in the EU um, and, and, and very much uh, sort of saturated with the language of uh, legitimacy, consent, um, terms that you note in the paper are not all that common um, among neoliberals. Uh, yeah. like they, they will, they will co-opt the idea of democracy as long as it is useful, but much of the language of a democratic deficit um, doesn't seem to, there, there seems to be some, it's not all that in common with, 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 with what the neoliberals are doing. So that, that's, that's and, 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 a, and a final question in this set uh, yeah. about the schism, right? Once, once, once this other branch of the, the neoliberal movement working from below ends up going after the institutions of the other branch working from above, does this produce a schism within uh, these, these associations where, where, where you have presumably members of both movements. And if not, if they manage to iron out these differences and, and get along with each other, why is that the case? And then, and then the, the second set of questions, which I'm gonna ask after you answer the first set of questions, uh, involve looking at the neoliberal movement as it makes its way from, from being a, a movement to being a political party, to actually having power, and, and the, the, the changes that happen as, 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 the, as sort of the, the, the movement goes through these stages. What we know, obviously, from having studied um, far right parties at different levels in their in their formation, then mm -hmm. they make compromises. They they change a lot, and and a lot of what I see in your new project seems like uh, changes in the neoliberal movement to accommodate the right. But I have a whole series of other questions about that, and and I'm going to let you answer these first questions. Okay. How, yeah, how yeah. 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 No, those are really those are really excellent questions. Um, so on the first point on, you know, was social Europe ever real or was that just a uh, phantasm that they dreamed up to keep their struggle going or to, you know, create a sense of themselves as an embattled minority, which was something they had certainly built their identity on since the 1940s when the idea was always we, few, the remnant, protecting the books and the mountain of, you know, Mont Pelerin in, in Switzerland. And, that was, a, that was a, a cherished identity for them. And there's some ways in which they didn't even always like to win because they liked to feel like they were the embattled outsiders. Very common in the conservative movement, of course, globally. Um, it's not a question I've looked into intensely. I mean, I think that one, one thing that was happening in the early 90s was an attempt to kind of um, equalize labor market conditions, especially around pay for women mm -hmm. and hourly wages. And there was a lot of talk about social dumping as a problem, right? And the, and the need to kind of reduce um, a, a common set of uh, workplace regulations, working hours were being talked about as something that was regulated Europe-wide. Um, so those things did exist. There were, of course, you know, a certain amount of structural funds, which were eventually, you know, proposed and then, and then made, made real. 
So there was, there was some substance to what they were saying. And I think that one of the interesting things about the 90s, and I think there's a lot that's interesting about the 90s, understudied actually by historians, maybe because as Danielle said, it almost feels too close to the present, but it's not, it's 30 years ago now, right? I mean, this is like a long, this is history now, is to what extent was there ever a possibility for the European project to take a more leftward socialist turn in the 1990s? Um, you have all kinds of arguments, right? From the kind of utopian hopeful to the pessimistic Wolfgang Strachian. And as usual, you know, there's a bit of substance to everyone's arguments on that. But I think that, I think suffice to say, there were asked, there were policies on, in, you know, in train at that time that could give some substance to that also around, um, around environmental regulations. Um, it was not as full blown as they made it sound Right, and and they they underestimated the countermeasures, which actually moved in their the direction of their own politics in favor of the few things that didn't. Um, to what extent was that all translated into practice? Um, so I think that you're right, especially those. So those referenda in the early 2000s were not sort of masterminded by sort of right-wing neoliberals. Uh, I wouldn't say that. However, the most effective, I think, um, opposition that neoliberals have put up against the European project actually hasn't been through the referendum, but has been through the courts, right? Through the constitutional courts. and before the introduction of the Euro, or before the, the formal, the formal um, passage of the Maastricht Treaty, it was, it was held up for some months because of two court cases. One court case was Manfred Brunner at the your German Constitutional Court, and the other was William Rees-Mogg, father of Jacob Rees-Mogg um, in, in um, the UK. And both were making the court case that that it went beyond the sovereignty of the national state to agree to the monetary union. Both of those were funded by, by multimillionaire backers. Um, Manfred Brunner was being funded by a guy named August von Fink, one of the richest men in, in, in Germany and in Europe. And, um, and uh, Rees Mogg was being backed by, um, oh, now I'm going to go and forget his name. Uh, Goldsmith, James Goldsmith, um, who didn't even live in the UK, actually was a resident of France, but was um, an intense Eurosceptic and actually tried to start a new party called the Referendum Party in 1994, for which he was the leading candidate, which, as you can guess, was based on one demand, which is have a referendum to make the UK leave the European Union. Since then, um, it came out most recently that August von Fink not only backed the AFD in its creation, but also Peter Gauweiler, who has, of course, spearheaded the most successful opposition to the EMU within the German Constitutional Court in the last 15 years. Um, so the place where kind of the funders and the legal minds, so to speak, of the neoliberal movement have had their most direct effect has been in these constitutional court cases. Obviously, this recent success with the, the German constitutional court is an extremely big deal. And, it, and it, it would have been another strand of the conversation that I presented today in the sense that those European constitutional group people um, who were not the ones that sort of drafted Article 50, it actually has a different story that comes from the UK, Article 50. But were, it were um, involved in creating the Alternative for Germany party, led by Bernd Lucke in its uh, first few years. And Bernd Lucke was the chief plaintiff on the most recent um, German constitutional court decisions that went against the EMU. So I think that you know, maybe this relates to the, what Danielle was saying about this, 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 um, this other presentation that's coming up. I mean, the, the far right has been very effectively using good old fashioned courts, constitutional courts to bring cases. And that's an important place to, I think, see the traction for their projects. The third question you had was about the sort of schism. And yes, it certainly existed. And, and the European Monetary Union is the easiest place to find that schism within the neoliberal movement. 
because you had, let's say from like 1990 to 2008, a, you know, you had a pretty even split between people saying the problem with the European Monetary Union is that it just isn't following its own rules. And all we need to do is make the sanctions stronger, force, um, force Germany and France to follow their own rules. And then this thing will work because it will become a kind of a monetary constitution for Europe. Then the other half of people were saying the stuff I was talking about, we need to get out, we need to restore national currencies, competing currencies, perhaps even cryptocurrencies by the end of this. The conduct of the European Central Bank during the Eurozone crisis tipped the balance heavily against the rules people in the sense that the people who had been arguing for the they just need to follow the rules and everything will be fine. Found it very hard to defend Frankfurt after the Eurozone crisis, which is again surprising, right? Because you think, didn't they bring the hammer down about as hard as they could on to the southern European countries, especially Greece? Not hard enough, according to the neoliberals of the mall power and society. They still not just caved in these individual bailouts, but quantitative easing itself is like. You know, it's the cardinal sin now for them. I mean, this is the source of all evil in the world economy is the um, the liquidity creating um, practices of the Fed and the European Central Bank. And that's something that is more or less unites the neoliberal movement now. There's one thing you won't find at a multi society meeting is someone saying that like Jerome Powell is, is okay, Janet Yellen did a great job, we did need to produce all of this liquidity and this level of money creation is sustainable and you know, no one will say that. That's the, that's the constitutive outside of the neoliberal imagination now. The enemy is uh, quantitative easing. So that brings them together. And so you might, have, uh, you might have Vaslav Klaus there, and you do, saying Europe is threatened by Muslim immigrants and refugees and we need to strengthen Western values. Uh, and then you might have someone saying, no, actually, liberalism is about plurality and we should be able to absorb new immigrants. But what they'll both agree on is the ECB is the center of all disorder in the European Union today. Therefore, we can forget these small differences over the fact that you're a xenophobe and I claim to be a cosmopolitan. And I'm not exaggerating. This is a quite yeah. literal description of the way that these conversations go. Um, and I know that also from conversations with people on the cosmopolitan side, because I don't email with the xenophobes, but I email with the cosmopolitans. And I, I call them on it. I say, well, how can you sit there with this guy? And they say, well, yes, I mean, no big tents. We, we share the values of the open society when it comes to economic freedom. Therefore, it's the lowest common denominator. We can accept that. Um, yeah, so maybe that was good enough for the first round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's excellent for the first round. That, that was very good. I, I guess my next set of questions is mostly about those strands of the neoliberal movement that have moved on uh, into party politics, into government, um, <laughs> and this seeming union between neoliberalism and, and the traditional far right, or the new right, whatever, is this, the this <laughs> xenophobic right. Um, and, and how should we think about this? Should we think of this as a synthesis? Should we <laughs> think of this, uh, this as a marriage of opportunity where, say, uh, neoliberals can tap in the increasing xenophobic vote and uh, the, the far right can take advantage of the prestige and the resources and institutions of the libertarian of the neoliberal slash libertarian movement which has been around uh, for, for much much longer as a legitimate sort of player uh, who, who in this relationship is dominates because looking at some of the Although, although, although you, you know, looking at, 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 at some of these movements, either, either in the opposition or in power, we would suggest, you know, look at Orban, look at, um, um, look at Turkey, uh, and, and you see these, these regimes have uh, neoliberal economies. They seem to take uh, neoliberalism for granted as a cost of operating, but it seems like their policies are guided more by nationalism. And if you look at the AFD or, or the Austrian Freedom Party, it, it seems like even there, although there, there, there are clear lem remnants of the neoliberal movement uh, from, from, from the, the early years, that, that in this relationship, it's, it's the xenophobes who end up, um, end, end up actually setting policies. And the closer you get to actually 
getting getting to the levels of power, getting to the seat of power, they're the ones who actually dictate uh, the yeah. the future of the party. And, and this is important because uh, you know far right parties tend to uh, be very good at catch all politics. They tend to be very good at putting forward you know carpet bag ideologies, and then you, the, the the scholar is left to tease out what's the dominant faction, which yeah. one is there just for show. Uh, and uh, and I'm trying to get a better sense of um, our what what is it? Who are the dominant players? And are are, are the libertarians just, just? I'm not the libertarians. I keep on I keep on complaining that the neo liberals. I think that's are the neo yeah are the are the neoliberals there uh, just just being taken advantage of uh, and 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 ending up like not actually influencing policy. Yeah. So that's. I can, yes, sorry, go ahead, uh, I wanted to interject a, a question from. The Q and A box. There is an anonymous attendee that asks something which may be apropos. Uh, could one view the 2016 Trump presidency as a populist reaction to neoliberalism and to global market forces? What about Brexit? Uh, thoughts? Just sure. I thought this was a good time yeah. to ask it. Yeah, no, I think that that's helpful to bring that into. So the the standard narrative from the many political scientists who have been following this for the last 20 years, right? So if you pick up a newspaper or uh, look at a journal like Telos or something from 1991, you'd be surprised that it's not from 2017, right? Because it's saying very similar things. It's like, there's a rise of populism, neo-nationalism, waves of racist violence in reaction to global disruption, economic problems. Um, geopolitical transformations out of the Cold War. And a lot of the, the parties are the same, right? I mean, Lega in its first incarnation, the Austrian Freedom Party, as you say, um, UKIP in, in the UK. And the political scientists that have looked at this, Front National, um, have basically said the same thing that is, I think, broadly true, which is that a lot of these parties, whether it's in Sweden or you know Spain, often started out with more neoliberal libertarian kind of principles. Often the operators were from that camp. Often the backers were thinking about the kind of Goldsmith, um, von Fink variety of, of backer. But then over time, mostly as a response to kind of electoral demand, attentive to what the voters were twigging to, they became ever more focused on anti-immigrant politics, ethno-nationalism, and national chauvinism, and so on. And I think that that, as a description, is probably pretty uncontestable. I mean, I think that I think that happened for sure with UKIP, right? It's founded by this neoliberal um, LSE prof, and then when Farage takes over, definitely it becomes more about like immigrant bashing. It happened with AFD, founded by a bunch of economics professors who then leave the party partially because they have this feeling that they're being taken over by people who mostly just care about, you know, um, you know, Caucasian pronatalism and anti-Muslim sentiment more than economic freedom. So I think that on the one hand, you know, we have to tell that narrative as something that does recur and, and it simply is a kind of a pattern. However, the thing that I think is important to point out is it isn't a case of a kind of unmarked neoliberal or libertarian philosophy coming into contact with this ethno-nationalism and then being swamped by it. Actually, the very neoliberal philosophy that led many of these ideological entrepreneurs to found these parties in the first place, to seek out these alliances, to be open to these alliances, was premised on an idea that culture mattered and that race even mattered for economic freedom. So it wasn't the case that you had universalistic economic freedom that eventually met a politics of difference. Actually, their idea of what market freedom was was already racialized and, and cut through with ideas of cultural difference. And to say that is not to um, actually speak too far out of the disciplinary mainstream. So new institutional economics, Douglas T. North, um, in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, North wins the, the Nobel Peace Prize. What's his argument? Well, his argument is that uh, 
We can't explain economic development without paying close attention to cultural beliefs, cultural norms. Why did the West win? Partially because they had these virtues of diligence and thrift and innovation and rewarding experimentation. Why did other cultures lose in the economic race? Because they lack these things. Um, William Easterly, you know, the great critic of development economics is making a similar argument. You can't just put a, give a bunch of capital to, you know, Namibia and expect Namibia to turn into Belgium tomorrow. Why? Cultural values, norms, family conventions, da, 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 da. Um, there is a strong dose of culturalism inside of mainstream economic thinking by the time we hit this post-Cold War moment. The neoliberals who I'm interested in were just gorging themselves on that. And so they already, when they started out founding, you know, UKIP, they didn't just found that thinking, hey, here's a great platform for our like universalist economic freedom-based politics. No, they founded it saying Anglo-Saxons have a certain tradition that makes capitalism possible. And we need to protect Anglo-Saxon purity to protect economic freedom. And there's no difference between these two. Meaning then they were naturally open to people who prioritized Anglo-Saxon purity over economic freedom. So I think that to me is the side of this story that has been overlooked so far, that you know that the precondition for these far right, originally market-based populist parties was, was a kind of, uh, is already this, what looks like a kind of hybrid ideology of culturalist economic freedom and so the, the question that was raised in the chat about, well, about Brexit is very easy to answer in this, in this format, which is that um, someone like Jacob Rees-Mogg, someone like Douglas Carswell and other operators within the European research group that really spearheaded the Leave campaign, they believed in um, economic freedom and culture being uh, inseparable from one another. Therefore, by implication, they believe that for British capitalism to thrive, it needed to be white. And therefore, when Farage and company turned it into an anti-immigrant campaign, they had no grounds to really protest. It was actually consistent with the vision that they had from the beginning. They may not have liked the optics of it. They may not have minded the optics of it as well. But I think that that's where this either or, either it is a market-based libertarianism or it's an ethnically driven nationalism, misses the point. The point is that libertarianism became culturalist in many of its dominant forms by this period. And that's how we can understand the kind of motivating ideology of a lot of these apparently disparate parties. Um, and then uh, the question about Trump. Oh man, I thought we were done talking about Trump, but here we are. Um, so I have a line about the 2016 election, which is it actually wasn't about Trump, it was about Bernie Sanders. And Bernie Sanders is the one who I think broke a lot of the taboos for a mainstream politician and started talking about the effects of free trade globalization and the way that it had local distributive effects and deindustrialization and you know started politicizing globalization as one of the two primary candidates for the Democratic Party in a way that nobody had except for maybe Pat Buchanan from the right in the early 1990s. So when he was defeated and Clinton was um, made the candidate, Trump just had to walk in and just pick up the some of the discourse that Bernie had left waiting for him. So he could, and as guided by Steve Bannon, of course, above all, he could just simply come in and say, yeah, exactly, Midwest, like Bernie was saying, um, gutted, factories, wasteland. Trump never believed a word of it. I mean, it's, it's not really a question of what Trump believed. Um, he capitalized on uh, understandable popular discontent about the uneven effects of the economic globalization we've had for the last 40 years. When in office, he did nothing to remedy it, obviously. So yes, he was a kind of a symptom of a changing political mood in the United States. I think that um, his own combination of economic freedom and 
ethno-nationalism was also quite blatant, right? I mean, vicious anti-immigrant policy combined with the biggest tax cut in decades um, suggests that those two things can, at least as a sellable party platform, work together. And let's be honest, if COVID hadn't happened, he would be in second term right now. So it's, it's not that you can't falsely respond to genuine concerns by offering a remedy that ends up only deepening the suffering for the very people that were complaining in the first place. You can do that and still win. <laughs> it's one of the horrible things about the world we live in, but maybe I'll leave it at that and see if there are any other so questions. I, I, I wanted to, um, to, to raise an issue that seems to be a common theme across many, many projects beginning with yours. Um, you take the idea of neoliberalism and you yourself have been a participant of the understanding that neoliberalism was anti-democratic and you yourself say, okay, so let's yeah. look closely and let's look at the fact that neoliberalism is a hybrid ideology or that ideology more generally is a hybrid thing, uh, wherever it lies. Um, I've had, uh, I've been studying the evolution of the European Union, there's several, po several points from a law perspective. At several points, I found myself confronted with this point of the hybrid ideology. Uh, the book by Nicholas Jabko, Playing the Market, explained the hybrid ideological stance of the Commission and mm -hmm. the uh, very uh, ambitious and uh, um, I, I don't want to say manipulative, but really, really opportunistic uh, bent uh, in one direction or another, more social, more market-oriented activity of the Commission uh, with the seemingly single goal of, uh, of going forward and therefore existing and justifying the existence of the institution. Right. Um, right. So um, the question is, is there, you know, is there a ideology in whichever form tends to be hybrid and therefore to build its own country from its own core? Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, is there something that doesn't move an objective metrics for people who do social science of any kind, mm -hmm. uh, who sort of uh, take a stance on things and uh, associate a specific meaning to specific words. Um, just to add a few points, I mean, when I, when I start talking about the European Union project with my students, we go back to the origins and we go back to the 40s when the project was an anti-Nazi communist-led project in France and Italy, uh, which at the same time would be realized through a neoliberal market agenda, I would call it neoliberal now. Um, mm -hmm. So hybridity was there from the beginning. Sure. I spent a lot of time understanding the private-public divide in the evolution of the uh, European legal uh, integration, and I found that the divide between private and public law is really a fence with the institutions and people jumping on one side or the other, depending um, on the end goal is um, on each day or in each historical period. Mm -hmm. So. Is there a way to get ourselves out of this? In other words, are there words that we can pronounce knowing that they are not hybrid, that, they are, that there is a vector in them that points to one direction or another? And in my research and my studies, I have found that the only question that is not quintessentially hybrid is the question of distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, uh, if we ask the question winners or losers, I think who, want, who wins and who loses, I think we have a better orientation of discourse that cuts through the muddling, uh, the, the muddled and impossibly hybrid concepts. Um, do you have a sense of the possibility of dehybridizing concepts uh, or, or facts or, um, uh, or, or, sure. or, or I, I mean, I, I, I get the urge of jumping out of the endless hybridization of ideas. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, I mean, I would say for one thing, you know, a hybrid is not a word that I myself use hardly ever in my own writing. So it's not that I'm bound to this category of hybrid per se. I think I will say one thing in particular in response to what you're saying, which is that I think it's very hard to give kind of broad political lab labels such as neoliberal to institutions as large and varied as the European Union, right? So there, I think, would suggest a one-to-one -one mapping of a certain body of political thinking onto a vast machinery of institutional incentives and mechanisms. 
that is just unlikely to ever happen, right? I mean, the nature of the European Union is it's sort of accretive and it's deliberative and it has been produced through compromise. And indeed, I mean, the chapter in my book on the European, Europe, European economic community makes this exact point, right? Is that neoliberals looked at the EEC in 1957 and they said, okay, we like the part about competition. We like eventually the European Court of Justice being attached onto it. The common agricultural policy, however, is something that looks horrible to us because it just looks like pure protectionism. So what is the European economic community? Is it neoliberal? That would certainly not be a helpful way to describe it. Is it then protectionist because of its agricultural policy? Yes, but then internally it's producing, you know, it's dissolving the state-owned model of industry and so on. So I think when you're describing institutions, I wouldn't really say, I wouldn't really even think you need to use the word hybrid. I think you just need to say it needs to be understood in its details and it needs to be historicized and understood, you know, in its complexity. And I don't think there's any way out of that one. Um, and when I use neoliberal, though, I tend to use it in terms of is a kind of is part of like the history of political thought, which is to say, you know, I understand it the same way I would understand anarchism or conservatism, which is a body of thought that has been built up over decades with certain privileged thinkers and privileged texts that one can sort of see schools and, and arguments within. And the, the creation of a kind of culture heavy libertarianism by the 1990s that, that argued that you needed to have you know, a certain sort of genetic or cultural endowment to be a functioning market actor. I wouldn't necessarily call that hybrid. I don't think you have to. I think you can call it culturalist. It was a culturalist neoliberalism. So then you're fine. I mean, in other words, if hybrid's the problem, no problem, throw that out. Just use more specific language. I think that if you want to come up with like a quick and easy uh, way of replacing it by simply talking about winners and losers, I don't think it's so easy because I mean, distribution isn't just about something measurable and you know income, right? I mean, people can win as workers and lose as consumers or vice versa. People can win through a subjective sense of freedom by being able to, you know, travel from country to country while losing in their wage level because of competition between country and country. For me, it doesn't it doesn't solve things so cleanly. I think you just run into just as many challenges of interpretation there as you do with any other choice of metric. Unless you want to be very economistic about it and say like, well, we're only going to use sort of satisfaction levels or, you know, per capita income. And I'm sure that you know, you like most political scientists wouldn't be happy with um, reducing things in that quantifiable way. We continue. Thanks. <laughs> Andre, uh, you, you had lots of questions. Oh, I'm all out of questions, like... actually. <laughs> yeah, please. Okay. has done a very good job of just covering everything. Uh, oh, are there okay. any questions from Q&A uh, from the audience? Uh, there is a comment by uh, Richard Olson, a, a friend of the center, who uh, talks about, about the fact that markets, markets are quintessentially non-democratic. Uh, the person who has the most money wins. That is neoliberalism in a few words. Um, I think uh, Quinn would add a few words to that. Yeah, I mean... There is no uh, question. <laughs> yeah, I think that... I think I would just disagree with that insofar as if you, and I can say why, because I think it's not, a, I think I understand exactly where you know, Richard is coming from. And I, in some way I do agree with him. But the thing is this, if you're someone who believes in the need to um, fashion laws and fashion states to accommodate this principle that he's describing, Right, which the principle, the principle being that um, the rich should be victorious. That doesn't happen without a state, nor does it happen without laws, right? There needs to be a set of laws then to protect the assets of this person who has won, to make it possible for them to accumulate more profit. 
to give them a space in which they can exercise power over people who have not won, right? All of these things require public institutions. Um, and neoliberalism, as I understand it, is a political philosophy that, that tries to figure out what those institutions should look like. You know, what institutions would we need to um, protect the victory of the wealthy? Do we want to only protect the wealthy and make sure they never lose their money? Or do we want to create a space where competitors who have more efficient ways, let's say, of producing product X, Y, or Z can also undermine the power of, you know, established private interests? So these are these are all questions that, you know, make it necessary to go beyond a kind of a blunt statement about having the most money. Don't they want the least possible regulation? No, see, I wouldn't see it that way. Because my argument in my book is that this, um, this dichotomy of sort of regulation followed by deregulation is really misleading because deregulation is as much of a legally proactive project as regulation was. It simply creates different winners and losers in Daniela's way of framing it, right? It, 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 it requires a, a, an extraordinarily elaborate apparatus of lawyers and legal institutions and treaties to arrive at a place in which one would say that this is free trade or this is the rule of the market. Um, take a look at the, you know, the, take a look at the, the WTO treaty, take a look at the accession documents for joining the EU, take a look at um, the USMCA, the proliferation of international investment treaties, bilateral trade treaties, and so on. We are in an era of ever more regulation or encasement, as I call it, um, to precisely do this apparently simple thing, which is protect property. So it's just, it would love it for it to, to be as simple as he's making it sound, but it's not. I mean, unfortunately, um, these simple goals require extraordinarily complex undertakings. And it's necessary to kind of understand how they look if we want to confront what seems like a simple. Yeah. Reminds me of hail freedom and coercion in a supposedly non-coercive state. I think that that remains a landmark of that kind of vision. Um, so we have a, we have run out of time. I would like to uh, thank you so much, both uh, Professor Snowbodian and Professor Mamolia, uh, Elizabeth Amarayan, uh, for making it always uh, possible and smooth. Thank you so much, uh, our um, attendees, uh, and uh, let's uh, stay tuned for further events. The, there are a few more comments on the. Q&A, I will forward them to, uh, to Quinn uh, so that the conversation can continue. Um, really enjoyable event. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you too. Thank you, Bye. Andre, especially. Great questions.